I'm Will Pinot. I'm the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much for attending this, this eighth webinar, actually, in our series of webinars about different issues facing our community um, after the COVID, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm pleased today to kind of give um, an introduction to Resilience Cayman. Resilience Cayman, its mission is to build food security and a sustainable future where all the residents of the Cayman Islands are able to contribute to the development of a thriving community, even in the midst of crisis, in the local economy and in involving the local economy and support self-empowerment in our Cayman society. The idea of resilience came in was born by Jan Gupta and Jan has been as a developer in Cayman and she's had this idea and she kind of approached the Chamber of Commerce with her idea and the executive committee and I felt that this program was something that was greatly needed in our community, particularly at this time as we're facing this crisis. So I want to introduce Jan to you so you get an understanding who she is and what her background is. She's a member of the chamber and she builds community-led solutions to address insecurity in housing, food, energy, health, and income. Her lifelong personal and professional experience in the corporate and nonprofit sectors in Canada and the US has led her to a unique understanding of what it means to be human in this time of accelerating disruptions fueled by technology and climate change. The impacts of these disruptions on residents' quality of life is where she sees a rapidly growing need for new solutions that are designed around the core vision of local community resilience that is in harmony with nature. Jan has, has worked very hard in Resilience Cayman, um, not only investing her time, but also her, her own personal assets into this initiative and with the support of the chamber, we hope that Resilience Cayman will be something that will be looked forward to as being an important um, tool in our arsenal of resilience for our community. So Jan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and your presentation. And thank you very much for agreeing for this webinar. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Will. I'm going to share my screen now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you can all see the screen, uh, my screen. I'm just going to share the presentation that we'll go through. And then I believe there is a, a time for a question and answer after. And so thank you so much, Will, for that wonderful introduction. I don't think I need to introduce myself. <laughs> you kind of covered all the bases. Um, so I would say that I am very pleased to be uh, proud to be a member of Chamber uh, and the great work that they're doing, uh, because really there is no playbook that any of us have for what we are all facing individually and as a society and as a planet. And um, certainly there are so many voices and ideas, um, and that's the wonderful thing I find about Cayman is that everybody is so engaged and motivated to, to lend a hand and to be at the table. And uh, so I'm really pleased to have the guidance of the chamber in really helping to understand what the needs are of the community, uh, along with, of course, the direct conversations and discussions that me and my volunteer team have been having with individuals who are most directly affected, um, are at the, I guess, bleeding edge of this crisis, or at least from an economic perspective. Um, so this is an initiative of the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm really proud to, to be able to say that uh, because I believe that the platform that the Chamber has and the research and insights that they bring uh, to the discourse about this is really invaluable. And so I'm really proud to be, uh, to be associated with them. Um, so just to build on uh, the mission, and it is, our focus is on food resilience because we believe that it underlies uh, resilience in general for any community, because if we can't feed all the people uh, and make sure nobody goes to bed hungry, it's really difficult to have any kind of intelligent conversation with a hungry person about skills retraining or anything else. So to support resilience building in the collective response efforts within KMAT, which really is designed to ensure that government, other NPOs, the private sector, 
who are already doing great things and great initiatives for this crisis and future crises that we are able to lend a hand. And the way we're doing that is to really understand where are some of the gaps, because uh, underlying all of it is really this uh, acceptance and realization, at least from myself and several other people, that this crisis is bigger than any one group. It's much bigger than what the government can support. It's much bigger than what any NPO can support or any business can support. So we really do have to come together and work together in order to make a big impact or the kind of impact that's needed to come out of this. Um, so when we did the kind of, uh, this is a summary version, but um, we have a, a more extensive kind of uh, uh, research behind this. So the current and emerging needs, the question, and when I did this uh, presentation originally about a month back, and we were only born um, once the shutdown went into effect. So the, the idea was there in my head for a long time, but the organization was only born um, once the shutdown began. So the local economic disruption, and since our focus is really on the workers and their families, um, there are lots of people in need on the island, but we believe that uh, a lot of the existing resources are already dedicated and doing a fantastic job for, in, for groups like the seniors and children. Um, but really the workers who experience this sudden economic shock in the form of unemployment, that's really where we saw that the, the need is much greater than any one agency is equipped to handle. Um, and because the, the need is so multifaceted. So we're looking at six to nine months as kind of the uh, acute phase of the disruption. And what challenges do we see emerging during this time? Obviously, financial is a big one. It's already starting to hit uh, more and more people as uh, the, some of the economic supports, the income supports that workers had from their employers start running out. A lot of employers did uh, heroic efforts really to keep as many people on the payroll as long as possible. But now coming into May, which is two months since the shutdown, especially in tourism and retail, um, their funds also are running dry. So more of that, that brunt of the financial impact is now being experienced uh, in individual homes and families. So the financial, uh, area is definitely one that we've identified. Legal is another one because our scope of work is uh, for all residents. So that's Caymanians as well as work permit holders. And in the legal realm, we see evictions, we see a uh, number of work permits running out. So I think the government has addressed kind of a stopgap measure for three months to make sure that nobody really feels uh, worried about having overstayed on their legal status. But if we're seeing this as being a six to nine month uh, acute disruption phase, then there may be more to do in that. And again, these are not necessarily areas that we have programs that we are looking at. These are just areas that we identified that there would be impacts in the in local society. Uh, Childcare and education had to do with uh, really whether children had the tools they needed uh, to be able to do online schooling. And I know that there's some great work going on to address that um, through various groups. So we don't have any initiatives or programs in that space. Um, social was another one, and this had to do with health and wellness and farms and small businesses. So this is really where having that tie in and being part of chamber is invaluable because we get, uh, we get a sense of what small businesses are facing and how chamber is supporting them. And then we're coming in from the worker side and saying, okay, so if this is how uh, the supports that are available to small businesses, how do we address the flip side of that, which is the workers and what they are facing. So it's really two sides of the same coin, if you will. And farms in particular um, have to do with that sector uh, business sector, which is smaller in Cayman, but certainly I believe that it is um, really key for part of the recovery, is that they have seen a, a reduction in their income as well because the hotels and restaurants were a big part of their customer base. So we do have some uh, programs that we are launching in, in that area to support local farmers. 
oops, there we go. Uh, so as far as our key goals go, there are three. One is to provide immediate relief to underserved groups. And like I said, I think the, the size of the problem or the crisis for workers, and that is both Caymanian as well as work permit holders, is much greater than any one group. Um, and government has actually acknowledged that. So we are part of the NPO groups. We're not the only one who are stepping up to, to support that with, uh, with our platform and, uh, and our resources. Uh, the second is to create a data platform that can quickly identify and assess what are the needs of these workers who are currently unemployed, how long will they be unemployed, um, what kind of needs do they actually have. I mean, we're doing a food support program uh, right now, but in a lot of cases, and uh, we have financials uh, submitted as part of the intake process from these workers, um, their deficit for their household is more like $1,000, so $150 gift voucher is only going to go so far, um, but it is a start. And the third is to support the individuals during this disruption so that uh, they are able to be prepared when the shutdown ends and are able to adapt to the um, local economy. And uh, so if they were in tourism, uh, then they have uh, an avenue for being productive in local economic sectors, even if tourism does not come back for a while. So our roadmap, and we're pretty close to this, maybe a week out, um, but the Food Voucher Initiative, as you can see, we launched this about a month ago, and uh, that was April 13th, and this was primarily, we coordinated everything with uh, the NAU specifically, um, and have reached out to various NPOs like ARC, uh, Meals on Wheels, um, as well as the Food Bank to really understand what their constituency is so that we can make sure that there's only so much in the form of donations and donor funds. So we wanna make sure that there is no duplication. It's not like a case of where certain individuals or families are receiving more than they can consume and others are getting nothing because there really is widespread need at this time. Um, so when we did announce this uh, a month ago, within um, three days of the announcement, we had 5,000 registrations. Now registration is essentially a pretty simple form on our website, which says I'm interested in applying for food support. Um, and that's not a full complete application because our application process is quite extensive. It asks for financial information about them, uh, their employment information, quite similar to the extensive process that NAU has. Um, we have worked quite closely in coordination with NAU and that process is working very well. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we really could identify people who either were not eligible or not currently receiving um, any sort of food voucher support from, uh, from that agency. Uh, so we open the applications. It's, uh, there's a window of time every month where this will be open. So in the month of April, that was on the 20th, and we gave people about 10 days to submit all of their information, personal identification, et cetera. Everything was done online because we don't have a, we're run by volunteers and we don't have an actual office to be, uh, to be running out of. Um, and uh, by, we took about a week after the window closed on April 30th to actually about 10 days until yesterday to go through. So of the 5,000 or 5,500 registrations, a thousand, over a thousand people actually uh, made the effort to complete their full forms, the full application with proper budget information as well. So we could see the size of the issue for that individual or family. And um, this is actually, as of last night, uh, I was working quite late until about midnight um, helping the volunteer team uh, we managed to actually complete the review of all thousand applications. Um, I'll have the results later on in the presentation to share with you, but essentially now we're in the process of uh, notifying all of the individuals who were approved of uh, the logistics of the pickup for the grocery card. 
which will be at the chamber office uh, later on, hopefully this week. Um, as far as, uh, like Will mentioned, this is something that is very close to my heart. And so not only in terms of uh, putting together the team and the programming um, and all of the numerous conversations that have taken place over the past, uh, I would say six weeks, uh, just under, and there is also been a financial cost to this, which I have funded. Um, and uh, then we have a donation goal, of course, um, and this is through Chamber for, in order to be able to support between 500 to 1,000 recipients for food support for two to three months, we are raising $250,000. Okay, so these are the results, and this is fresh off the press uh, from, from midnight last night. So this is from month one, uh, where we were still testing some of our processes and having the volunteers all trained to review applications. Of the, like I mentioned, the 5,500 in, in re registrations we received, 1,000 people of those 5,500 completed the full applications. And of those 1,000, 614 were approved for a $150 gift voucher. These numbers are staggering. Um, 394 were declined primarily because there were uh, gaps in terms of the information that they had provided. And we had uh, actually had our volunteer team contact them sometimes, several times, try to reach them to help them if they needed assistance filling out the application and uh, were not successful in that. So 614 were approved as far as details of if we were to just look at status on island. Uh, 306, so about 50% are Caymanian, 12% PR, and 38% work permit. Um, in de decline, it's uh, similar. Half of the people declined were really because they didn't even complete the form enough in to tell us who they were, um, other than their name and, and um, email address, but did not provide further information on their status. And then the ones who did, of the 394, 28% were Caymanian, 19% work permit, and 8% PR. And I will say that in addition to the food support voucher, what we are also doing is uh, sponsoring meals uh, in partnership with the board. And so essentially a subset of this 614 people who were approved had also asked to be considered for the meal a day program. Uh, at the wharf. So of these 614, 158 applicants are actually receiving a daily meal from the wharf starting today, um, in addition to their $150 gift voucher. Uh, as far as some of our other initiatives that are coming up, we are actually, we have another group of volunteers who are mostly from the financial industry who have put together uh, our own content, uh, really they have designed it around financial literacy. So these will be de delivered through webinars uh, from the chamber, but also we have an online course that um, we, we will be taking the, uh, in, in this case, uh, several of the people of the 614 who were approved for food cards um, also qualify for financial budgeting uh, skills because we see that the need for their family is going to be quite great over the coming months on how to bat manage their budget when there's only so much and they're struggling to pay the bills. So there will be one-to-one -one counseling for that. In a lot of cases, they are also have applied, I believe the last count I heard was 7,000 or over 7,000 people that applied for their pension fund uh, access. And many of the, the 614 people who are receiving our food cards are also individuals who, have, uh, who are looking to pull out money from their pension to pay for their rent, for example. So they are in dire need of one-to-one -one counseling on how to make those, those dollars stretch so that they can keep above water um, for a longer period of time. Whether that is until a repatriation flight can, can happen or in the case of Caymanians, until they are uh, able to be employed again, uh, either at their previous employer or in new jobs. Uh, so that, that program is about to kick off in, uh, by the end of this week. So uh, in addition to those, the subgroup of 614, which will be going through the financial literacy, um, there are also five, over 500 
individuals who have applied directly to, who, weren't, who didn't necessarily apply to food support, who have also asked for financial counseling. So this program also will be quite large. Uh, so we could potentially be looking at about a thousand people who at no cost are receiving um, professional financial guidance on, uh, on their budgets. Uh, by the end of this month, we're also looking at uh, bringing out, we had announced this earlier and the work on the online farmer's market is almost complete. Um, and there, that's called FarmBox. And um, what we are doing with that is to, again, it's not a replacement for, it's an additional channel for farmers to be able to sell their local produce. The farmer's market, the in-person one is now open. Um, and I do know of various individuals who are still hesitant during this curfew time to be stepping out and going there. And they are also now wary about um, spending money in cash and would prefer cashless payments. So online farmers market allows for that and also provides an additional channel free of cost to the farmer for them to be able to sell their produce uh, to, to local residents. And it also has this added benefit of being able to divert any food loss. We're hearing more and more about uh, how farmers have too much uh, crop in their fields in the US and uh, because of the, the stoppage in the tourism and uh, restaurant sector, they are burning the crops in the field, dumping milk down the drain. Um, we don't want to see that kind of thing take place here. So wherever possible, we are stepping in to ensure that food is diverted to better uses, whether that's donations to the various um, meal programs for the community or um, are able to be sold uh, through the online market. And the last one, and I actually hope that this would actually be able to, we would be able to execute on this sooner, uh, but there is a worldwide shortage of vitamin C, similar to the, uh, the masks and the toilet paper. <laughs> Um, so the 30 day vitamin C supplementation is really targeted more at essential workers, frontline workers, if you will. So not just healthcare, but also grocery store and delivery drivers, anyone who's out there um, and dealing with the public and exposed to the virus. So this is just about a uh, one time supply of uh, trying to boost up their immunity. So we do still plan to have that, but this might have to take place in phases as we get our hands on vitamin C supply. There's only so much on the island right now, and I'm told that there's about a two month uh, wait to get more uh, supply from, uh, from suppliers off island. Uh, in terms of governance, the chamber board, so uh, Will has been instrumental in that, um, and uh, Woody Foster as well. And the whole chamber board really are providing uh, really, really valuable guidance and oversight for us in the various areas. Since we are not uh, an NPO uh, of our own, we are um, able to benefit from their guidance in program delivery, donations, management, everything is being handled through chamber, um, through the chamber website actually and uh, the funds distribution and the coordination, like we are um, also working with, with various groups in government and NEOC, as well as other NPOs. And really the goal here is to ensure that we're not doing anything under the cover of darkness here. We are accountable for what we're saying we will do, and we are working very hard with our volunteers to make sure that we actually deliver everything that we are, uh, we are promising to deliver. And then transparency. Uh, how donations are received, how much is received, uh, how it's deployed, it's all being part of a regular reporting process that we have put in place and are still working to fine tune further as we go along. Um, in terms of sponsorships, like I said, it's low overhead. We're trying to deliver as much of our programs online as possible um, and just be able to do partnerships with various groups, with, both within government and in NPOs. And we are 100% volunteer run. And uh, so we tie all of the funds we're raising back to what is the impact that it's creating. And I believe the only way we can do that is to be able to have good data. And so the, part of the investment for us has been in creating a good data platform. 
And therefore I was able to, after finishing at midnight last night, going through a thousand applications, able to present you today with actual meaningful statistics on how it all kind of played out uh, because of the, the data engine. Uh, so our, our sponsorship packages are really at those three levels. And um, for anyone who's interested in, in uh, learning about that more, you can email me. My email is down here, jacob.resilience.ky. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to have a conversation on that. And that's pretty much my presentation. So I'm going to stop now and give the give the platform back to Will. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'm more than happy to unmute your mic. So can the public make small, smaller donations is one of the questions, Jan. Yes, absolutely. We've received uh, I mean, the community, even though we are so new, uh, the community has really stepped up. We're getting donations as small as $25 and accepting every dollar of that um, with a lot of gratitude. Uh, that is available. You can do it through Chamber directly, and you can also go to the resilience.ky website, and there is a donate button on there. Um, so you just click on that, and it takes you through a payment gateway to Chamber. Um, and you're able to pay by credit card. For the larger donations, we would uh, suggest an alternate uh, just to reduce bank fees for the credit card processing. I would say you can do online bank transfers um, as long as it is marked to uh, uh, Resilience Cayman and uh, the bank transfer goes direct to the Chamber bank account. So we will make that information available. Right, you have uh, Butterfield as our bank. So if you bank with Butterfield, there are some fields in there where you can do online transfers through Butterfield. And there's a Chamber of Commerce section there. Be sure to put it to the Chamber of Commerce and not the Chamber of Commerce pension plan, which are for contributions to that plan. So, so Jan, tell us a little bit about the next steps that you're gonna take in this. So this week we're planning to distribute some of the food vouchers so I know you gave us a timeline. Um, you know, how, how do you think it's going generally? It's going really well. I mean, so we are really, there's so many firsts here in terms of at least for us as a group um, in the sense that this is the first round of food vouchers on the scale that we're talking about. 600 people all being notified at the same time that they have been approved for vouchers. And I can tell you that some of the acknowledgement emails back from these individuals, uh, all of them are really um, hurting for food. And so even for the 158 um, who have um, said yes to the meal program, uh, these are people who again, um, some have children, a lot of them are here by themselves so they don't necessarily have family to fall back on for support um, and not having the funds available to feed themselves has been quite a hard hit. So we're just getting organized in terms of a volunteer team um, will uh, for us to be able to set up and get approval from curfew for volunteers to be able to um, set up a table at the chamber office so we can distribute the vouchers. But I think that there will be a big wave of them probably by the end of this week when we open it up for pickup. Um, and then we're giving them about 10 business days from when we uh, open up the distribution office uh, to pick up their voucher. If they don't pick it up in that time, we make those vouchers, we put them back in the pool for the following month. So the first round uh, of food vouchers is about 15,000 CI dollars, right? Approximately. Uh, the, hundred, the first 103 of the, and now we have a final figure, which is 614. Right, but we've started with 103. Yeah. And then you have 158 who have been approved for the meals program through the wharf, right? Yes, yes. And of those 158, 73 are enrolled in this week's one week of meal meals at the wharf starting, um, I guess, in about an hour. Yeah. So everybody knows the Chamber of Commerce actually receives no, no benefit from this program, meaning none of the money that is collected 
goes to the Chamber of Commerce. It's all for, for resilience. So every dollar that is, is donated goes specifically to Jan and her team for all of these programs that we've talked about. So I just want to be very clear on that. And also, Jan, just let's talk about, you know, coordination with the other organizations and how resilience really is different from those organizations. Um, I'd say our intake process is quite different. Um, we're not necessarily out there um, in the community in person uh, and getting to meet all of these individuals in person. So what we have created is a, through our website, our intake process allows for people. And what we're finding is in some cases, individuals are feeling a little bit of that um, privacy um, because this is not necessarily a time that they are proud of to be without a job. And so for them to be able to fill out um, a form that says, I need help in the privacy of their home um, is something that quite a few of them are saying they feel more comfortable with. So I think that our, the method that we are using for the intake is part of what sets us apart. Um, and then the, what that also does, the investment in the data, the back end, is allows for us, so when we received 5,500 registrations in three days, the server did not go down. It was able to handle that kind of volume. Um, our actual applications, and we're talking extensive information about their budgets. Um, we have that data down to an individual's level and we are able to then help them as we go into the following month to say, okay, what has changed about your life situation from a month ago? And so we, we can create, the beauty of data is that you can create the journey for the person you are assisting. And the goal is of course, to get them off the assistance and back employed and productive in society. And we had a great meeting with the needs assessment unit and we developed a strategy for us to basically work together. So one of the big concerns in any crisis is whether people are trying to abuse the donation systems, right? Or the, the receipt receipt system. So I know you have worked and we've talked with NAU to ensure that there is no real duplication unless there really is a real need, like you said. And based on the online forms that you've created and the review process, we try to ensure that people are not double or triple dipping into uh, assistance so that the money that is collected is best used. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That's exactly it. I'll, I'll share with you what we've done. Of the first of the 614, we have cross-checked 103 in the first batch with NAU last week. And it was as simple as us having an Excel spreadsheet, which just had a list of names and date of birth, and that's all NAU needed to cross-check. We sent it to NAU, they cross-checked it with their database, and sent it back, made notes on the individuals that were a match. It turned out out of the 103, there were maybe about 15 that were in the NAU database. And uh, they made a note of when they, these individuals last received a, a payment from NAU. And in a lot of cases, it was a month ago. So essentially what we've created is, uh, we said to NAU, okay, well, so we're going to distribute voucher to this individual for May, you can make a note, you don't have to in that case, you can defer your next payment to this individual for June for that food voucher. So what it does is actually create savings for NAU so that they can deploy their budget to help additional people. Now I get a lot of questions now, which is fantastic about the need for volunteers. A lot of people in the chat are saying, do you, do you want to, they want to volunteer. So tell us the process of that and really how specific the volunteers and what their jobs would be depending on their expertise. That's exactly it, Will. Um, we do have a button on our website as well for volunteers. So that's the first place to go. And as part of the volunteer intake, uh, we do ask for, you know, what are the areas, which programs they're interested in, because we do have specific programs that are ongoing right now some that we are in the process of launching and some like food support that we've now established with this first month. 
Um, and so we are getting a better sense of what the skill set and the needs are in the process. We ended up needing, we had about 10 to 15 volunteers who were all very good with um, computer, like, you know, looking at a database, looking at a form, but then they also needed to understand what budgeting meant. So to be able to look at uh, a family's budget and say, okay, your income is zero and your spend is about 2000 a month. So you're ending up with negative 2000 at the end of the month. How is that, you know, how are you dealing with that? How is that actually working? Um, it, it requires an individual who can kind of understand and be comfortable enough to be able to talk on the phone with the person who's actually experiencing that hardship. Um, and so it really took for us to get to the point where we were able to select interview, one-on-one one -on -one interviews, um, and we have some HR volunteers on our team. So they are very well versed in interviewing volunteers or individuals to understand their skill set and then be able to recommend this person would be great for this role in terms of the programs that you have. And tell us a little bit more about the financial um assistance kind of um, volunteer that, you know, you're gonna have, you're unveiling, I think shortly, the whole idea of providing people with financial guidelines as yes. to their budgets and how to spend money in, in these crisis times. So how many volunteers do you have just in that area? Uh, we have five who are all up and trained and another five who've signed up. And these are all individuals who are accountants in most cases or financial like they're actually designated financial professionals who work in financial industry. They have full-time jobs, um, but this specific program is where they want to be involved. Um, they don't necessarily have the time to be able to go distribute vouchers, for example, uh, but this is something that they feel they can do from their home in the evening after work. Okay, excellent. And again, I think we're already getting through the chat, people who want to dis help distribute the food vouchers. That's so, wonderful, thank you. I would say <laughs> reach out through the volunteer button on our website and indicate your interest. Because I know there are some businesses that are um, down right now, but that would like to do some volunteering. So I see Paulinda here. Paulinda, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Hi, good Paulinda. Morning. Uh, representing Human Concerns, Costa from New York, as well as the Department of Children and Family Services. But had a quick question, as it relates to uh, persons, and I take it from the conversation that you all are getting applications from a lot of work permit holders, am I correct in saying that? Yes. Okay, what is the partnership with CBC um, works in terms of cross-referencing. You mentioned um, NAU, um, that partnership, but what is the partnership with CBC? Uh, at this point, there isn't because our focus is just on providing them with food, not well, necessarily when I, when about I their that, when I ask that Because we know that there are persons who are on work permit, but they're also still working. So you have some persons who are actually still working, collecting um, a salary. How does that play into um, applying for humanitarian aid when you're still able to pay your bills to prevent, um, again, we spoke, you spoke about ensuring that um, the funds and the assistance is able to at least last as long as we need it, but also keeping that in mind. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, you're right, because we want to avoid situations like that where people who don't need the assistance are, are receiving it. Um, so we, in the actual application, we ask for details of their employment and uh, name of their supervisor, the phone number, we verify if their employment uh, has terminated, if it's been suspended, meaning that they still are on the payroll, they might be receiving $100, $200, uh, maybe their, their health insurance is being paid, but they're not getting their full salary. So we have uh, scenarios where it's either a termination um, or a suspension. A lot of retail stores, we are uh, seeing applicants from retail sector who fall into that group. So they may have jobs to go back to when the stores open, but right now they are really not even on a living wage. Um, and then there are individuals who are like realtors uh, or work in real estate 
who were self-employed, they were 100% commission, may not have had a salary or they had a small salary. Same kind of thing where the business has just stopped completely. And so whether they were, um, if they are, their employment may not be terminated, but the immediate impact is that they don't have enough income to be able to pay their bills and, and buy food. So um, I'm happy to, Paulinda, again, this is kind of our month one, who we were able to reach out to and suggest that we coordinate. Uh, but I wouldn't say that we've shut the door in any way. In fact, I would love to have those conversations with any agency that you would suggest that we, we go and sit with and talk with over, you know, over Zoom, for example, and share what we're doing. Look at the uh, success of the early success that we've established with NEU that the process can work uh, without a lot of work for either side and happy to do that with other uh, groups that are involved in supporting uh, individuals who are facing hardship. Absolutely. So the door is completely open and uh, I, I would just need some suggestions on uh, who to who to talk with. Thank you. I would also suggest that we also have further conversation from a Department of Children and Family Services perspective, whilst NEU is still the key agency in providing financial assistance. We do provide support, particularly to those families that we are working with um, due to children being in care or foster care. So also ensuring that, again, that we don't have persons triple and um, double dipping right. into the assistance that's provided. We are also involved with um, community support. Our community development officers are also in the communities. So they also have their ear to the pulse of what's happening. So uh, we can uh, have further conversation. That would be great. Yes, I definitely. I think that's, that's definitely something I would love to do. Uh, and especially now going into month two, we have about a month to put further um, process in place for that. And in some cases, I'm actually finding that we have individuals who need further support and those are not supports that we have in-house in our programs. And I wanna be able to refer them to the right groups. Um, and right now I'm not quite sure who that is. So I would definitely welcome your assistance on, on setting up that process between us. The, the other thing to share, Jan, from uh, the National Emergency Operations Center, um, Human Concerns Cluster, uh, our Red Cross partners also sit under that cluster. And part of their remit is looking at the voluntary agencies, responders, and uh, we are in the phase of which they have developed a national framework for humanitarian assistance as it relates to COVID. So would also welcome you to be a part of that because some of the things that you have spoken about is what has been placed under the mandate of Red Cross to do a register of those organizations, individuals who are involved with providing um, donations, humanitarian assistance and keeping a uh, national registry. So that's something that I think we would also need to have further discussions as to you know how you all are recording your your donors, who they are, and to to be able to ensure from a um, government NEOP perspective that information is definitely being recorded, and uh, the transparency and the accountability is definitely something that we're we're ensuring that's taking place. I think you're doing a fantastic job. Um, again, as you said earlier, we're all learning when it comes to this, and really want to say thanks to Resilience Cayman, and we look forward to further partnerships. So Thank we'll you. include you um, hopefully this week. I know we have, uh, Will, are we still on for one o'clock this afternoon? Yes, uh, I've invited Jan to that meeting, and I could just Wonderful. answer the transparency question because obviously the Chamber of Commerce is audited every year, and we have to have financial procedures and guidelines. So. Absolutely, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting that that's not happening. Um, absolutely. No, no, I'm just, I'm just telling you, just as a matter of fact, it's not to challenge what you're asking. It's really just saying that's why we're very transparent, actually, and we will be, um, you know, telling people how the money is being spent. I mean, the reality, as I said in the beginning, is that every dollar that is donated to this program is going right back into the community so that we can help as many needy people as possible. And that's what this is all about in this crisis. With regards to the volunteer list, 
um, these are again chamber volunteers and, and Jan's keeping a great database about that. Just a question for you about that national database though, Polinda. Is that something that's accessible to the community? Uh, Eddie is on the call um, from Red Cross. Eddie, are you there? I can advise later because it's something that is going to be ongoing. So it's not just for this crisis. It's for, um, for the future. It's something that they've been working on um, since last year and have sent out um, to the various organizations to get their information as to what, what assistance they, they can provide during a crisis. And I'm sure more than likely once that um, truly comes live and online, that persons will be able to see that. Yeah, I see, I see Danny's hand up from the NEOC, so I'll just unmute her, but thank you, Paulinda. Uh, thank you. Hi, Will. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. And again, um, really good work by Resilience K-Man. Uh, just to follow on from what Paulinda's saying, yeah, the, the VAS, the Voluntary Agency Responders under the NEOC, is basically a co-chaired by Hazard Management and Red Cross. Now, given the nature of this emergency and, and the lack of sort of HR resources from our side, uh, the Red Cross are kind of leading on the, uh, the registration. By way of history, I mean, the VARS was sort of set up about 12, 15 years ago, actually, after, after Ivan Days, just to make sure that everything was coordinated on a national level. Um, and again, making sure that there's collaboration and lack of duplication. I think our biggest worry to date in the last 15 years is that whilst there's some really good work being done, um, that, you know, there's always going to be some duplication. And I, and I understand you're working very close with NAU, who are also members of VARS, but it would be great to have... Um, us all on that conversation at one o'clock today, just to make sure that uh, we're all, you know, working together and making sure there's no duplication. I know ARC are doing some great work as well, but it'd be yeah. good to get everyone's list so that we're all on the same page. Absolutely. That's all for me. Yeah, because every, every program is unique in its own way and volunteers will volunteer for the programs that they believe they, they, they support. So I understand the, the need to understand who's doing what. So we'll, we'll certainly work that out. But um, other, there's another question that came in by phone. Um, if the application was made in one spouse's name, can another spouse collect on their behalf? Um, the voucher pickup, you mean? Yeah. Yes, pickup, pickup can happen. In, in some cases, we have individuals who don't have access to transportation since there's no public transit uh, right now. So we are making alternate arrangements in those cases. But if people are able to, as long as the, the individual picking up has the approval email showing that they are there to pick up for this individual on their phone, then um, they should be able to pick it up. And there's another question that came in. What is the process of requirements for persons to update their job details, terminated, suspended, rehired after initial registration? So as to pre prevent persons from continuing to receive these benefits, even after their employment situation changes, and the support is no longer needed. So the it's not a one time you get enrolled and then it, the support continues month after month. Every month is a new window. So that's to say that each individual kind of has to uh, provide any updates to their specific situation. And we do have the volunteers who are verifying with employers and of course we're following and Chamber is also doing a great job with having a list of which businesses are now open, et cetera. So I'm hoping that in a month's time, we will be in a situation where more businesses are open. Uh, we do ask people to provide their, who their employer is. So if it's Kirk Freeport, for example, well, we'll know if Kirk Freeport has opened their stores, et cetera. So uh, it's, it does take work though to make sure that uh, each individual's situation is addressed um, uniquely. Okay. Well, there don't seem to be further questions, Jan. I'd just like to thank you for participating in the webinar and providing really some great responses to your questions and some information about the presentation about what Resilience came in really is. Just like to tell everybody on, on the call right now is is really, if you're interested, we're looking for volunteers, we're looking for donations. So please, if you know of people that are in a position to be able to support this initiative, we'd really, really appreciate it. 
We're trying to help out with people who are really in need in our community. In addition, to provide additional you know, support for all of those other platforms that are out there. Because not everyone can do it alone. We all have to work together to make sure that everyone is filling a, a certain component in our society so that the needs of our community are met. So thank you, Jan, for the presentation. And um, you. hope you have a great day. Thanks and so much. Everyone else has a great day. Hope everyone has a good day. Have a great day. Bye.